Okay, grade nine, this is lesson number 10, isolation and speciation. We have three lessons this week and that's the end of this unit. So next week we'll be doing review activities and then we'll be doing our unit test. And then moving on the following week to chemistry. So here we go, isolation and speciation. So here's your template for today. Please make sure you draw it out your notebook, um, your drawings here. You're gonna have to draw um, one, oh, you need to draw one drawing here showing um, example of geographic isolation. Here is a graph, and here we have a choice of drawings. This one here, this drawing you can draw if it helps you, but it's not as critical because it's more descriptive. Um, but there's some really cute drawings you can also draw to help you with that as well for this if you choose to. But these are the three drawings you're expected to include and will be checking for in your homework submission. So pa pause the video and do your drawing, please. Okay, so first things first, what is speciation? Well, these two dogs here, Chihuahua and a Great Dane, they belong to the same species, and that species is Canis familiaris. So if you know anything about um, species names, like for example, humans, we're Homo sapiens, um, they have two parts. The first part is the genus name, and it's always capitalized, and the second part is a species name, which is lowercase. Now, when you type a scientific name, you put it in italics, and when you write it by hand, you underline it. So make sure you underline this in your notebook. So these two dogs are the same species, even though they look very, very different. So if they can be so different, but still be the same species, how can we define a species? Well, the way scientists define a species, the official definition, is that it's a group of individuals that can breed and produce a fertile offspring. So those dogs, if they can breed together and they can produce offspring that's fertile, that that offspring can then breed, then they are the same species. Now, if you look at this word here, speciation, can you predict what you think it means based on now we know what a species is? Well, speciation is the process of forming new species, and we do that through the course of evolution, through a variety of different factors can cause it. We're going to talk about four different examples today of, of situations that can cause speciation. The first one is geographic isolation, and you need to do a drawing for this one. You can choose to draw just the top half if you like, or just the bottom half. But you should be making sure you're very clear of the color differences in the allele frequencies. The that we have mostly the red allele here, which is a light brown color of deer, and mostly the blue allele here, which is a dark brown color of deer. So you can choose to draw it this way or draw it this way, but make sure you draw it clearly in your notes. So we have already talked about gene pools. We've talked about populations changing over time. And we understand that when a gene pool is changed for whatever reason, that can lead to significant changes in the species as a whole, the population of that species. So can you think of any examples of this happening, gene pools changing that you've looked at so far in this unit? Well, hopefully you thought about all the examples of genetic drift we talked about. We talked about um, the elephant syndrome, the case again that. We talked about the Pennsylvania Amish. Um, this is a gray, uh, sorry, I think it was right whales um, with the bottleneck effect. And we also talk about gene pools can be just from natural selection. But if there's a very strong selection factor, it can cause populations to change rather quickly. In geographic isolation, this is caused by some sort of geographic barrier. So this is very similar to what Darwin talked about. We talk about geographic evidence for evolution, same kind of idea here. But this is the idea of there's something in the environment changed, which may be preventing these two gene pools from mixing. So maybe we have a mountain that appeared um, over time, something changed, and now we have a geographic barrier between this population and this population. It can happen after an earthquake. It can happen uh, from river being run over, flooding, all these kinds of things can happen that can cause this. And because this barrier prevents the two populations from mixing, over many generations, this can lead to speciation. So let's say there was no mountain pass here. For a long time, a mountain range divided these two deer populations. And over time, they changed into new species. 
And then something happened, an avalanche, a rock slide, and a pass opened up, and now we can mix. The idea is the, the barrier here is going to affect the populations. So let's take a look at this example a little bit further, and I want you to take a minute and really think about this one and connect it back to our four principles of natural selection. Those keep coming up again and again because they are really important. Okay, and I was not happy with how it went on the quiz if people weren't talking about all four of them, so we want that to not be an issue on your unit test. So please take some time right now, um, go through all four principles to talk about variation, step modification, adaptation, and overproduction. Talk about all four of them for the deer population. How those two coat colors, the yellowy brown light -like color and the dark color, how those two coat colors might have evolved. Okay, so hopefully we're talking about um, the fact that there must have been some sort of an adaptation advantage to having a different coat color. So in the original population, we had a variation in coat color. Where there was some dark, some light, something in between. And then um, overproduction, there was too many deer that could survive. Maybe there's lots of predators. Maybe they need to be a little higher for their environment and camouflage better. And the adaptation, the one color, the light brown, was better on this side and definitely better on this side. Maybe the tree cover was different species of trees, different color bark, easier to hide darker over here and lighter over here. And then some modification is the ones who are more likely to survive are going to pass on their genes. So mostly light brown ones survived over here and passed on their genes, and mostly dark brown ones survived over here and passed on their genes. So always go back to all four principles of natural selection when you're talking about any examples. Okay, the next type of isolation is called behavioral isolation. And so even if a species is able to get together geographically, there's nothing blocking their way, there's no river blocking them, there's no mountain range, um, they're not on different islands, they're able to still get together, there are other barriers that prevent them from reproducing. And those, are, those barriers are just generally termed reproductive isolation. We're going to go through three types of reproductive isolation. The first one is behavioral isolation. So this means that for in a species, their mating rituals or their courtship rituals do not match. So for a lot of pieces of birds, the bird song is really important for attracting a mate um, or display. So we looked at birds of paradise and how they dance and how they fluff their feathers out to show the female they're really healthy in sexual selection. Um, if that's not the right dance, then the female won't mate. Uh, in whales, the male whales, like humpback whales, they will sing to attract a mate. So that's behavior, and if it's not the right behavior, they will not mate. So even if two species are able to interbreed, if their courtship rituals don't match, they will not mate, and that's what they call behavioral isolation. So these are two of them different bird song. I think this is pretty funny. Um, so we have that idea here. Another example here, this is called the blue-footed booby, and it does a courtship dance. So here's the first part where they're kind of going back, back, foot to foot, and then we have the pointing display part, pointing their beak up, their tail up, their wings up, as part of their courtship dance. And if a different species of bird can't do the right dance, then they will not get to mate with the booby. So that's one part that isolates this population from other bird populations that live in the same environment. Okay, the next is temporal isolation. So temporal has so time. So this is about when two, the mating seasons of two species is different. And it's different enough they're not going to be able to mate at the same time. So in plant species, this is usually about pollen. So we have flowers here, the reproductive organs of plants, and they release pollen either into the wind, maybe a pollinator comes to get it, some way to release the pollen, and then that needs to land on another part of the flower. Now these two flowers are not going to cross-pollinate or mate because this flower is still closed. You know, this one is open. So they have different bloom seasons and release pollen at different times and therefore they're temporally isolated. Whereas animal species, a lot of them have very specific mating seasons. When the females will go into heat, which has different names in different species, but a great example, um, there's lots of cats in robot right now who are in heat and the meowing is crazy. Um, so it's the season when the female is able to reproduce. And during that time, when the females are in heat, sometimes populations like the elk we looked at, um, they might come back together to a bigger population just for mating season. So here we have two examples of skunks. 
Um, we have the eastern spotted skunk and the western spotted skunk. These are two separate species. You notice scientific names here, okay? Um, Spilogale pretorius and Spilogale gracilius. So they have the same genus name, but different species names. So they're different species, but they're closely related to each other. And a big part of how they diverged and became different species through speciation was because the mating seasons were different. So the eastern spotted skunk, its mating season is late winter, whereas the western spotted skunk, it mates in late summer. So when this skunk is ready to mate, none of these skunks are ready to mate. They're not going to be able to mate together because they have different times. So even if two species are able to interbreed, they're not geographically isolated, they're not behaviorally isolated, if their seasons don't match, they will not mate. So here's the drawing for this one. This shows the mating activity in different months for five species of frog. Now let's take a look at this graph and really think of what it's showing you here. And I want you to think about why the times of year the seasons are when they are, so they for this particular frog species. So these are five frog species that are all found in North America. I want you to think about why would they have evolved to mate during March through to July. So take a minute and think about that. Pause the video. Okay, so hopefully you thought of the fact that, well, in North America, that's going to be springtime and then summer. And we shouldn't have frogs mating in the wintertime in the fall. Because when frogs lay eggs, they lay them in the water, and when the eggs hatch, they make tadpoles. And tadpoles will freeze and die in the wintertime. So if you have the, if you lay your eggs and mate earlier in the year, the tadpoles have more time to kind of grow and get bigger. So a big part of why none of them really mate after July, because they're still going to have August and September, it's warm weather to get to hatch the eggs, become tadpoles, become a frog, and be able to spring to survive for the winter time. So those are the months when those frogs are going to survive. Okay, the next one is mechanical isolation. And I kind of wish we were doing this in class, so I like to see you guys get embarrassed when we talk about this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, I don't get to see your faces when we talk about damselfly penises. So when the two genitalia of the male and female of a species, where they can't actually fit together, like a key in a lock or whatever kind of analogy you want, um, they cannot actually mate. It's a physical, mechanical, as such a thing. Do not fit together. So for example, these are penises of different damselflies. And actually, the, the dotted part is dotted on the diagrams. It's, it's meant to, go, it fits very carefully into the side of the female of that particular species. They're very different between them. And the dotted part is designed to go in and scoop out the sperm of a previous male. So the female is made of multiple males. Um, then the, the last male to kind of scoop out the old sperm and implant his own sperm is going to father the eggs. Um, so this is one from a mechanical isolation that can't actually fit. So this example, this picture here, this is the female, the blue one is the female, and she's kind of attached to the male, but the male is attached to her, and he has his, like, key-shaped puzzle penis inside of her to scoop out the previous male's sperm and implant his own sperm. Damselflies, actually, the mating takes a little while to do this. Um, another type of mechanical isolation has to do with plants. So plants that have flowers, flowering plants, um, the shape of their flower and the shape of the insect, the pollen of the insect that goes to goes there, has to match. If it doesn't match, pollen can't be exchanged. So remember, insects go to on birds or bats. They go to pollinate flowers, and they're called the pollinator. And their role is to help the flower reproduce. If the pollinator goes, say a bumblebee goes to one flower and then goes to another flower of the same species, it's going to carry pollen on its belly, on its back, on its body from one flower to the next. And you kind of think of pollen as the equivalent of flower sperm. It's going to transfer it from the male part of one flower to the female part of the next flower and then allow those flowers to reproduce sexually. So here's a picture of this part. So here's the insect. You can see these parts here that has a pollen on it. It's the anther of the flower. And the, the insect fits particularly on that, on that plant so that way the pollen, the flower, will hit the top of the head. And when the insect goes to the next flower, then it's going to fit the same way and it'll pass the pollen on to the next flower. 
Another example of mechanical isolation here, we have some snails. So here the two arrows show the genital openings of these two snails, but they're not matching up. These snails are not going to be able to mate. They're mechanically isolated because of the shape of their bodies. They can't actually match up the genital openings, so therefore they can't mate. So how would that lead to speciation? Well, if those individuals can't mate, they can't exchange DNA, and they're going to become, um, then they're not going to mix their gene pools. And that can lead to differences being formed by whichever ones for from this one's the ancestor of and this the ancestor of will be different because they can't connect their DNA. What about flowers and the pollinators here? So how did the flowers evolve those shapes? Why does a flower have this shape that's specific to its pollinator? Think about the four principles of natural selection again. Well, it was within variation in flower shapes. We must have had overproduction where not all the flowers who, are, who uh, bloom are able to reproduce. Um, the adaptation is the closer the flower shape is to its pollinator shape, the more likely they are to successfully pass on their DNA. And so modification is the flowers who are able to successfully be pollinated and pass on their DNA are going to have um, make more seeds and produce more offspring in the next generation. For this um, type of isolation, mechanical isolation, you can choose to draw the snails or the flower and the insect. Um, you can also choose to draw this if you want to, but you need to draw one of the examples of mechanical isolation. It's your choice which one you want to draw. Okay, that was our last of isolation. Let's talk about your example of the study here. So I don't know if anyone's been to Panama. Um, I was there actually last March, it's pretty cool. I saw the Panama Canal. Um, so the Isthmus of Panama is this tiny bit of land that separates, kind of connects North America and Central America to South America. And when it was formed, it separated the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. For a long time, those were connected. This is our Earth about five million years ago. If you know about tectonic plates from the continents shifted, and as it's being formed, it would have separated the water here and the water here. And that caused isolation of the marine species. And marine species are species in the ocean. So what kind of isolation is this? Well, it's geographic isolation. The marine species fish can't climb over the land on the other side. So they can't intermix those populations. But when the Panama Canal was built, when humans built the Panama Canal, they reconnected these two bodies of water. And that is a really interesting question for evolution. So we have species that were isolated uh, for millions of years, and they've just recently been reconnected. So I want you to work the partner or a group of three and describe whether those long isolated marine species, let's say you can think of a fish if you want, if a fish from this side and a fish from this side, if they were able to reconnect going through the canal, could they interbreed or could they not? And why do you think so? Just to kind of clarify here, this is the old picture. But there was a gap here between this panel but didn't exist yet and now here it is today. So here we have the Atlantic and the Pacific over here, and here is the Panama Canal. It goes through a lake and then back out here. Okay, so there is the entire path. And so could a fish from this side and a fish from this side, after being separated for many millions of years, could they connect? And if they did, could they interbreed? So please answer that question. Try to use the four principles of selection in your answer to talk about it, and um, get feedback from your teacher. I right, guess your homework is to complete the page from today's lesson and upload them to Schoology. Make sure you also include your drawings and your Panama Canal case study analysis. Once again, I hope everyone's okay, home safe, and not going too crazy. Uh, looks like we're going to be away for another the month at least. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or concerns about anything, just feel free to email your teacher. Take care, guys.